What is up everyone, my name is Joseph and welcome back to Casually Competitive MTG where it's our goal to bring you semi-competitive EDH gameplay content that is both fast paced and entertaining. Today's gameplay is a little bit special in that it is our first season finale, our season 1 finale. This means that the winning decks of our first 4 seasonal videos will compete head to head in one final match for you today. Before we get into the opening hands and deck introductions, I do have a few quick promotionals to get out of the way. The first being, we do have a Patreon, link is in the description. If you like what we do and you do want to support us in that way, we do believe the reward system that we have set up for Patreon is well worth your money if that's something you're interested in. Also, if you do want to just connect with us, talk to us, or just be part of our community, we have a Discord link in the description as well. It's available to all, so go ahead and join that if you're interested. And finally, if you are looking to buy cards in the near future, be sure to check out our deck lists and card links in the description. Using those links will kind of tell TCG Player that we sent you, and any purchases you make will help the channel out a little bit at no cost to you. That all being said, let's get into the opening hands and the deck introductions. Going first, we have Joseph playing his blue pod deck, the winner of Season 1, Episode 1. The goal of this deck is to use control and hate bear slash stacks pieces to slow down their opponents, all while getting value out of Thrasios and cards like Birthing Pod in order to assemble one of his combos, the main line being a Kiki Jiki Felidar Guardian combo. His opening hand contained a Mana Confluence, a Horizon Canopy, a Windswept Heath, a Hollowed Fountain, a Findhorn Elves, a Collector Oof, and a Fey Burrow Elder. Going next, we have Jordan playing Holland Teller of Tales. This champion of Episode 2 looks to get value off of Holland by playing cheap creatures in order to draw into one of the many combos in the deck. If you're interested in viewing all of them, the deck list is in the description, but a main line for this deck would be Mana Breach and Shrieking Drake with Holland on the field, which will allow the player to play Shrieking Drake, bounce a land due to Mana Breach, replay the land and draw a card off of Holland, and then bounce Shrieking Drake, essentially drawing one card for free. Jordan's opening hand contained a forest, an island, a mana crypt, a worldly tutor, a wirewood symbiote, a Phyrexian revoker, and an aura of silence. Going third, we have Adam playing the winner of episode 3, Anala Archmage Ritualist. This deck, which I like to call Grixis Hulk, but is more widely known as Wizard Chess, looks to assemble a combo using Spellseeker and then copying Spellseeker with Anala in order to tutor up a specific set of cards that essentially allows Adam to create an infinite amount of hasty wizards. Adam's opening hand contained an exotic orchard, an island, a swamp, an underground river, a mana drain, an ad nauseum, and a shallow grave. And finally, going last, we have the underdog Bill playing Kalia of the Vast. This deck won episode 4 of our first season, and being the only non-blue deck, the goal of this deck in this pod is going to be to ramp out quickly and swing with Kalia to put cheap but disruptive creatures on the board very early. The win cons of this deck include a World Gorger Dragon animate combo line to generate infinite mana and then have an outlet, and it also contains Bolas' Citadel, Sensei's Divining Top, and Aetherflux Reservoir in order to gain enough life to use Aetherflux to win the game. The seven cards in Bill's opening hand were an Exotic Orchard, a Mountain, a Vampiric Tutor, a Children of Corliss, a Dockside Extortionist, a Helm of Awakening, and a Necromancy. Now with the opening hands and the deck introductions out of the way, let's get into the gameplay. Joseph starts off this game today by drawing, playing a mana confluence as his land for turn, and immediately tapping it, paying one life to generate a green mana to cast the Fint Horn Elves. He then passes the turn to Jordan. Jordan draws and plays a forest as his land for turn. He then casts a mana crypt for zero mana. He then taps this mana crypt to cast a Phyrexian Revoker. When it resolves and as it enters the battlefield, he names Thrasios, turning off one of Joseph's partner commanders. He then gives the turn to Adam. Adam draws and plays an underground river as his land for turn and immediately passes the turn to Bill. Bill draws and plays an exotic orchard as his land for turn and then decides to give the turn to Joseph. Joseph untaps, draws, and shocks in a hollowed fountain as his land for turn, losing two life. He then pays one life to tap his mana confluence for mana to help cast a Fey Burrow Elder. With nothing left, he goes to pass the turn to Jordan. On Joseph's end step, Jordan taps his forest to cast a Worldly Tutor. Before this resolves, Bill takes the opportunity to cast a Vampiric Tutor. The Vampiric Tutor resolves, Bill tutors up a card to the top of his library, loses two life, and Jordan then resolves his Worldly Tutor, searching a Lotus Cobra to the top of his library. Jordan then goes to his turn, untaps, and in his upkeep loses his Mana Crypt trigger, taking 3 damage. He then draws the Lotus Cobra and then taps for 2 mana to play this Lotus Cobra. 
He then plays a Plains as his land for turn, and as it enters, he makes a white mana with Lotus Cobra's ability. He uses the floating white mana, the floating colorless mana, and then taps his Plains for a white to cast an Aura of Silence. It resolves, he then goes to combat, and swings his Phyrexian Revoker at Adam for 2 damage. Adam declares no blockers, takes the damage, and Jordan then gives the turn to Adam. Adam untaps, draws, and plays an Exotic Orchard as his land for turn, and wanting to hold up mana, gives the turn to Bill. Bill untaps, draws, and plays a Wooded Foothills as his land for turn, immediately paying 1 life to crack it, to search in a Blood Crypt and having it enter the battlefield untapped, taking 2 more damage. He then taps for 2 mana to cast a Dockside Extortionist. It resolves, and when it enters the battlefield, generates 3 treasure tokens. He then sacrifices all 3 of these treasure tokens to generate 3 red mana to cast a Wheel of Fortune. Priorities get around, and realizing he likes his hand, Adam taps for 2 blue mana to cast a Mana Drain targeting the Wheel of Fortune. There are no other responses, and the Mana Drain successfully counters the Wheel of Fortune, and Bill then passes the turn to Joseph. Joseph untaps, draws, and decides to tap for 2 mana to cast one of his partner commanders, Thrasios Triton Hero. He then goes to combat and swings the 3 3 Fabro Elder at Adam. Adam declares no blockers and takes the damage. In his second main phase, Joseph taps his Fabro Elder to generate a green, white, and blue mana, and then uses the white and green mana to cast a Collector Oof. He then pays 1 life into Mana Confluence to generate a green, and then uses the floating blue mana to play an Incubation Druid. He then plays a Windswept Heath as his land for turn, and decides to give the turn to Jordan. Jordan untaps and in his upkeep wins his Mana Crypt trigger, not taking any damage. He then plays a Windswept Heath as his land for turn, and when it enters, he makes a blue mana from Lotus Cobra's ability. Jordan then pays 1 life to crack his Windswept Heath, searching up a breeding pool to the battlefield and having it enter untapped, and as it enters, generates another blue mana from Lotus Cobra. He then uses his floating mana to help cast his commander, Holland Teller of Tales. He then goes to combat and swings his Lotus Cobra and his Phyrexian Revoker at Adam, and, declaring no blockers, Adam then takes 4 damage. Jordan then gives the turn to Adam. On his turn, Adam untaps, draws, and at the beginning of his first main phase, adds 3 colorless mana to his mana pool from Mana Drain. He then plays a Swamp as his land for turn, and then taps for 1 black mana to cast a Dark Ritual, floating 3 black mana when it resolves. He then uses some of this black mana to help cast Ad Nauseam. Knowing that a lot of the swingers on board are coming at him, he decides to go for broke here and just starts flipping cards. He gets down to 8 HP and decides just to go a little bit farther, looking for just a little bit more protection, and then flips over the highest CMC spell in his library, Scholar of Ages, bringing him down to 1 health. He decides to stop the Ad Nauseam there, and then taps his mana to help cast a Nightscape Familiar, honestly at this point, just trying to get some blockers on the field. He then exiles Simeon Spirit Guide from his hand to generate a red mana, and then uses that red mana to cast a Faithless Looting. Feeling very unlucky and with nothing left to do, he moves to his end step, discards down to 7 cards, and then gives the turn to Bill. Bill untaps and draws, and then plays a Mountain as his land for turn, and decides to hold up a little bit of mana, and pass the turn to Joseph. On Bill's end step, Joseph pays 1 life to crack his windswept teeth, finding a stomping grounds to the battlefield, and having it enter tapped. Joseph then goes to his turn, untaps, draws, and immediately goes to combat. He swings Collector Oof and Thrasios at Adam. Adam blocks the Thrasios with the Nightscape Familiar, and then taps for 1 mana to cast a single target Cyclonic Rift, since Nightscape Familiar reduces it by 1, targeting the Oof. Cyclonic Rift resolves, Thrasios is blocked, Adam takes no damage, and in his second main phase, Joseph plays a Forbidden Orchard as his land for turn. He then taps it for a green, giving Adam the 1-1 one, one spirit. He then uses the screen mana to help recast Collector Oof. When it resolves, he then taps 3 mana to cast a Meltdown, X equaling 2. There are no answers to the Meltdown, and all of the artifacts CMC 2 or lower get destroyed, including the Phyrexian Revoker, enabling Thrasios. With nothing left, Joseph passes the turn to Jordan. Jordan untaps, draws, and then taps for 1 green mana to cast a Wirewood Symbiote. On cast, he draws a card and puts a Polluted Delta onto the battlefield due to Holland's ability. 
When the Polluted Delta enters, he adds a white mana to his mana pool due to Lotus Cobra. Wirewood then resolves, and he then pays one life to crack his Polluted Delta, searching up a hollowed fountain to the battlefield, untapped, losing two more life. When it enters, he generates another white mana due to Lotus Cobra, and then uses this floating mana to cast a rest in peace. He then goes to combat and swings Hullen at Adam, who decides to block with his 1-1 spirit, taking no damage. Jordan then passes the turn to Adam. Adam goes to his turn, untaps, draws, and plays an Urborg Tomb of Yawgmoth as his land for turn, and decides to just give the turn to Bill. Bill untaps, draws, and plays a Mountain as his land for turn. He then taps for one white mana to cast a Children of Corliss. He then looks at his hand and gets really sad that that Wheel of Fortune didn't go off, and decides to give the turn to Joseph. On Bill's end step, Joseph taps for four mana to activate Thrasios, scrying one card to the bottom, and then revealing a birthing pod, and then drawing that card. Joseph then goes to his turn, untaps, draws, and plays a waterlogged grove as his land for turn. He then takes one damage from the grove to help generate enough mana to cast his other partner commander, Bruce Tarl. When it enters, he gives the Faeboro Elder double strike and lifelink. He then goes to combat and declares Thrasios as an attacker at Adam, and the Faeboro Elder as an attacker at Bill. Adam decides to take matters into his own hand, taps his underground river to generate a blue mana, dealing one damage to himself. Bill then declares the Children of Corliss as a blocker for Faeboro Elder, and in response to moving to damage, sacrifices the Children of Corliss, denying the lifelink. No damage is dealt by the attackers, and Joseph then gives the turn to Jordan. On Joseph's end step, Jordan pays 3 mana and taps Hullen to bounce Wirewood Symbiote to his hand. He then goes to his turn, untaps, draws, and taps for 1 mana to replay his Wirewood Symbiote, drawing a card and putting a strip mine onto the battlefield off of the Holland trigger. He generates one green mana from Lotus Cobra, and when the Wirewood resolves, he uses this floating green mana to help cast a Sylvan Library. He then plays an island as his land for turn, decides that he has plenty of mana, so he activates Strip Mine, destroying Bill's Blood Crypt. Jordan then goes to pass the turn to Bill. Bill untaps, draws, and plays a Plains as his land for turn. Really mana starved and really not having the cards he needs, he goes to pass the turn to Joseph. On Bill's end step, Joseph pays 5 mana to adapt his Incubation Druid, putting 3 plus 1 plus 1 counters on it. He then taps the Druid to now generate 3 mana, along with the Forbidden Orchard giving Bill a spirit, in order to activate Thrasios. He scries one card to the bottom, and puts an Arid Mesa onto the battlefield tapped. On his turn, Joseph untaps, draws, and plays a Horizon Canopy as his land for turn. He then decides to go to combat, and declares Bruce Tarl and Collector Oof as an attacker at Jordan, and Thrasios and the Faeboro Elder as attackers at Bill. On attack, Bruce gives Double Strike and Lifelink to himself, and then, going to blockers, Jordan declares his Wirewood Symbiote as a blocker for Bruce Tarl, and Bill declares his Spirit as a blocker for Faeboro Elder. In response to moving to damage, Jordan activates Hullen to bounce his Wirewood Symbiote, again denying the life gain, and then damage happens, Collector Oof deals 2 damage to Jordan, and Bill takes 1 damage from Thrasios. Joseph then decides to pass the turn to Jordan. Jordan untaps and draws two additional cards due to Sylvan Library, taking eight damage to keep all three. He then taps for one mana to cast a Birds of Paradise. On cast, he draws a card, but does not put a land onto the battlefield from Helen's ability. He then taps for two mana to cast Lavinia Azorius Renegade, again drawing and not putting a land onto the battlefield off of Holland. He then taps for one green mana to cast a Wirewood Symbiote, again drawing from the Holland trigger and not having a land to put onto the battlefield. He then goes to combat and swings Hullen at Bill. Bill declares no blockers and takes two damage. Jordan then passes the turn to Bill. On his turn, Bill untaps, draws, and is just not able to find what he needs and has to just pass the turn to Joseph. On Bill's end step, Joseph pays four mana to activate Thrasios, revealing a Pyroblast and then drawing that card. He then activates Thrasios one more time, revealing a Force of Will, and then drawing that card. He then takes one damage from Mana Confluence, and taps Forbidden Orchard, giving Bill a Spirit, in order to activate Thrasios a third time. He scries one to the top, and then reveals a Linvala Keeper of Silence, then draws that card, and goes to his turn. 
On his turn, he untaps, draws, and immediately goes to combat, swinging the Faber Elder and Bruce Tarl at Jordan and Thrasios at Bill. On attack, Bruce Tarl gives the Faber Elder double strike and lifelink, and then going to blocks, Jordan declares Birds of Paradise as a blocker for Faber Elder and declares Hullen as a blocker for Bruce Tarl. Bill declares no blockers, and Bill then takes one damage from Thrasios, and Joseph gains four due to one of the double strike attacks getting through with Faber or Elder. Joseph then, in his second main phase, taps for four mana to cast his Linvala Keeper of Silence. He then pays one life to crack his Arid Mesa, searching up a basic planes to the battlefield. He then takes one life from Horizon Canopy, and then pays two life for the Phyrexian mana, to help cast his Birthing Pod. Bill gets a 1-1 Spirit from the Forbidden Orchard being tapped for mana, and Birthing Pod resolves. Now you may notice that Joseph did not pay the 2 extra from Aura of Silence, and honestly, we were just a little late remembering the tax from Aura of Silence. However, every time that this tax isn't paid immediately during this game, there is always mana available, so every time that this is a problem, it could have been legally paid for, and there's no major impact to this game. That being said, when the Birthing Pod hits the field, Joseph passes the turn to Jordan. Jordan untaps, draws two extra cards due to Sylvan Library, and then pays eight life to keep all three. He then taps for enough mana to cast a Mana Breach. Knowing that this is one of the absolute main win cons, especially with Lotus Cobra on the battlefield, Joseph taps for one red mana to cast a Pyroblast targeting Mana Breach. Pyroblast resolves, Mana Breach is countered, and Jordan then pays one green mana to cast an Avacyn's Pilgrim on cast, drawing a card, and not putting a land onto the battlefield off of the Hunland trigger. He then taps for another green mana to cast an Arbor Elf, really just looking for some land drops at this point. He draws a card, and again, does not put a land onto the battlefield. With nothing left, he passes the turn to Bill. Bill untaps, draws, and in his first main phase, taps for enough mana to cast a Biforce X equaling 1, targeting the Birthing Pod. Since Collector Oof is on the battlefield, Joseph isn't even able to activate this in response, and the Birthing Pod is destroyed. Bill then goes to pass the turn to Joseph. On Bill's end step, Joseph activates Thrasios, paying 4 mana to scry 1 card to the bottom, and then revealing a forest and having it enter the battlefield tapped. He then goes to his turn, untaps, draws, and plays an untapped Sea of Clouds as his land for turn. He then goes to combat and swings Linvala Keeper of Silence at Jordan and Bruce Tarl and the Fae Burr Elder at Bill. On declaration of attack, Bruce Tarl gives Linvala double strike and lifelink, and then moving to blockers, Bill blocks the two attackers with two 1 1 spirits, and then as damage happens, Jordan takes six in the air and Joseph gains six from the lifelink. In his second main phase, Joseph pays 4 mana to activate Thrasios, scrying one to the bottom and revealing a Corridor Monitor to his hands. He then taps his Faber Elder for 4 mana to cast this Corridor Monitor, and when it enters, untaps Faber Elder. Joseph then pays 4 mana to activate Thrasios one more time, revealing a Dovin's Veto and then drawing that card. With nothing left, he passes the turn to Jordan. Jordan untaps, draws two extra cards due to Sylvan Library. He decides this time not to pay any additional life, keeps one of them, and then in his first main phase, casts a Prowling Serpapod, on cast, drawing, and finally putting a forest onto the battlefield off of the Holland trigger, generating a blue mana from Lotus Cobra. The Serpapod then resolves, and Jordan then casts an uncounterable Shrieking Drake. On cast, he draws a card, and does not put a land onto the battlefield, and then when it enters the battlefield, Jordan decides to have Shrieking Drake bounce itself. He then goes to combat and swings Hullen at Bill, who declares no blockers and takes two damage. Jordan then passes the turn to the starving Bill. Bill untaps, draws, really just looking for probably a land drop at this point, and unfortunately is not able to find one and has to pass the turn to Joseph. On Bill's end step, Joseph activates Thrasios, scrying one to the bottom, and then revealing a flooded strand and having it enter the battlefield tapped. He then takes three damage from all of his pain lands to help generate enough mana to activate Thrasios again, revealing a fluster storm, and then drawing that card. Not able to activate Thrasios anymore, Joseph decides to go to his turn. Joseph untaps, draws, and immediately goes to combat. He swings Linvala at Jordan, and again, Bruce Tarl and the Faber Elder, and this time Collector Oof, 
go at Bill. On Declaration of Attack, Bruce Tarl gives Lunvala double strike and lifelink, and then in response to that trigger, Jordan flashes out an Avon Mind Sensor. Jordan then declares the Avon Mind Sensor as a blocker for Lindvala, and Bill decides to double block the Collector Oof, killing it, and then taking 7 damage. Joseph then gains 3 from the lifelink from Lindvala, and then in his second main phase, taps for enough mana to cast a Smothering Tithe, paying the 2 extra for the Aura of Silence. He then passes the turn to Jordan. Jordan untaps and draws two additional cards due to Sylvan Library and does not pay for any of the Smothering Tithe triggers and Joseph gets three treasures. He decides to only keep one card and then, in his first main phase, Jordan taps for a blue mana to cast a Shrieking Drake. On cast, he draws a card giving Joseph a treasure from the Hullen trigger and puts a planes into the battlefield, making a blue with Lotus Cobra. As it enters the battlefield, it bounces himself and Jordan then uses this floating blue mana to recast Drake, drawing a card and putting a City of Brass onto the battlefield, making another blue mana. He then repeats the loop again, drawing another card, putting a flooded strand onto the battlefield, making a blue mana doing it one more time, this time putting an island onto the battlefield, making another blue mana, and then decides to do this one last time, unfortunately missing his land drop this time, and bounces the Shrieking Drake to his hand. He then decides to tap some of his lands and some of his creatures to help convoke out a Chord of Calling, X equaling 3. Knowing the 3 drops that are in this deck, Joseph decides when priority gets to him to tap for one blue mana to cast a Dispel in an attempt to counter the Court of Calling. He passes priority and Jordan does have an answer as he exiles a Trinket Mage from his hand, pays one life, and casts a Force of Will without paying its mana cost, targeting the Dispel. Priorities get around and Joseph does have what he needs, taps for one blue mana to cast a Flusterstorm, with all nine copies targeting the original Court of Calling. The Flusterstorm copies then resolve and the Court of Calling is countered. Jordan then pays one life to crack his Flooded Strand and searches up an island to the battlefield, getting one blue mana from his Lotus Cobra. Jordan then remembers what Joseph was hoping he would continue to forget and sacrifices his Aura of Silence in order to kill the Smothering Tithe. With the Smothering Tithe now gone, Jordan pays his floating blue mana to recast his Shrieking Drake, drawing a card and not having a land to put onto the battlefield. He then recasts his Shrieking Drake, drawing another card, this time putting a Forbidden Orchard onto the battlefield, generating a green mana from the Lotus Cobra trigger. When the Shrieking Drake enters the battlefield, Jordan returns his Avacyn's Pilgrim to his hand, and then uses the floating green mana to recast this Pilgrim. When it's cast, he draws, and it does not have a land to put onto the battlefield. He then taps for enough mana, giving Bill the Spirit from the Forbidden Orchard being tapped for mana, to cast a Smothering Tithe. In response, Joseph taps for 2 mana to cast a Dovin's Veto, targeting the Smothering Tithe, countering it. With nothing left, Jordan passes the turn to Bill. Bill untaps, draws, and decides it's now or never. He taps for 3 mana and pays 4 life to cast a Toxic Deluge for 4, trying to just reset the board at this point. Unfortunately for Bill, Joseph does have an answer for this, and taps for 2 mana to cast a Delay, targeting the Toxic Deluge. The Toxic Deluge is countered, and Bill then pays 1 mana to cast a Sensei's Divining Top. With nothing left, he goes to move through his phases, However, in response to moving into combat, Joseph generates 3 mana and then uses the floating mana from Incubation Druid in order to activate Thrasios, scrying one card to the bottom and revealing a Spire Garden and having an end to the battlefield tapped. He then takes 1 damage from Flooded Strand to search up a Steam Vents to the battlefield and having that end to the battlefield tapped. He then goes to his turn, untaps, draws, sacrifices all 7 of his treasures to cast an overloaded Cyclonic Rift. It resolves, and now with the board clear of blockers, he goes to combat and swings Linvala and his Fintorn Elves and his Corridor Monitor at Jordan, and Bruce Tarl, the Fabor Elder, Thrasios, and his Incubation Druid at Bill. On attack, Bruce Tarl gives the 4-4 Fabor Elder double strike and lifelink, and then, with no blockers, does 15 damage to Bill, gaining 8 life, and doing enough damage to Jordan to take him out of the game. He then goes to a second main phase and pays 4 mana to activate Thrasios, scrying one to the bottom, and revealing an island and having it enter the battlefield tapped. He then activates Thrasios one more time, scrying one again to the bottom and revealing a Quarion Ranger to his hand. 
He then passes the turn to Bill. Bill untaps, draws, and prays for a miracle. For zero mana, he casts Mana Crypt. He then taps this Mana Crypt to cast a Helm of Awakening. He then, for zero mana, recasts his Sensei's Divining Top, since the Helm of Awakening reduces it by one, and he then activates his Sensei's Divining Top, hoping the top card of his library can somehow save him. He draws a card, puts the Divining Top back on top of his library, and then goes to pass the turn to Joseph. Joseph untaps, draws, and just immediately goes to combat, full swinging a bill, dealing enough damage to win the game. Honestly, this game had a little bit of everything that our playgroup has honestly kind of come to know and love. It had a little bit of stack slowing the game down, it had someone go for broke basically taking themselves out of the game a little bit early, and it did have a deck that kind of just whiffed completely and wasn't really able to interact with the board at all. Not all of the things that this game exemplified may have been positive, like the Kalia really not being able to pop off this game. But I did think it kind of had a good mix of everything we've released on this channel. In my opinion, it made for a very good season finale, just kind of wrapping up everything we have made so far. That being said, in terms of a little post-game recap, I want to talk about two things specifically. The first one being, pretty simple, the most valuable card this game honestly has to go to Thrasios. That card is just so insanely good. Even without training grounds on the battlefield, which I, as the Blue Pod player, love to see, that card still for 4 mana to go 2 cards deep multiple times a turn is just insanely beneficial in these grindy, kind of longer games. I believe this game went to turn 10 and there were so many Thrasios activations that really got me personally where I needed to be. So that card has to be the most valuable card in this game. The part of the game that I want to talk about to just give a little bit of review on is Adam's kind of going for broke strategy early on in the game and then a decision that was made based on that play. So first off, why did Adam continue to go with the Ad Nauseam? It may seem like he had everything he needed to just kind of pop off right there, but knowing what was in his hand and what was in this Ad Nauseam pile, he had absolutely zero protection. Realistically, he could have won there with the cards that he had in his hand and in the Ad Nauseam pile, but against two blue players, it was very risky. If either of the blue players had interaction, or even if Kalia had the right interaction, there was really nothing Adam could do to stay in the game, so his only chance, if that was to happen, would be to have a free piece of interaction in his hand. Now you might think it was a little foolish to go that low, however, it kind of made sense. The only 7 drop in that entire library is Scholar of the Ages, and at 8 life, if he had hit Force of Will, he would have taken 5 damage, and it would have left him at 3 plenty of health to win the game. So going down from 8 really was a pretty safe bet. The chance to hit the one card that honestly kills you is incredibly low, and the chance to dig maybe 1-2 to two cards deeper could be the difference between letting your combo go off and getting stopped by a counter spell. So although he did get very unlucky, I did want to talk about why he continued to go deeper with that ad nauseum. At that point, he was either winning or losing right there, and getting a little bit safer with his hand and just digging, searching for maybe the one to two pieces that could stop any interaction was kind of worth it, and most times, in that exact situation, wouldn't kill you. You just did get a little unlucky. With that being said, I do want to talk about something that happened soon after this ad nauseum play, and that is Joseph deciding to give Adam the 1-1 one -one spirit. And this was done very intentionally. For the rest of this discussion, I will refer to myself as me, but the Holland deck at the table is my personal deck, so I do know that deck fairly well. And the two creatures that Jordan had on the battlefield, the Phyrexian Revoker and the Lotus Cobra, both 2-1s, and both are very incredibly important to A, stopping Thrasios, and B, generating a massive amounts of mana and value from the Lotus Cobra. So giving Adam a 1-1 blocker forced Jordan to have to swing with two creatures in order to kill Adam. Adam still could have one if he had access to his graveyard when he got to his turn, so getting rid of Adam was a matter of either having a counter spell available or taking him out of the game. So giving Adam the blocker forced Jordan to either have a non-combat related answer or to get rid of one of his two very good 2-1s. In the end, he did end up having Rest in Peace, which shot Adam off of his combo even though he did make it to his turn, but if he didn't have that Rest in Peace, Jordan would have either had to waste a counter stopping Adam from comboing off, or lose one of his 2-1s, both of which would have been fairly detrimental. 
So I just wanted to point that out because it was something that I found interesting since I was directly involved in that play. And I found that whole turn cycle just very fun to play and I thought it was very interactive and there was a lot of discussion that went on in the game itself. That all being said, that is all we have for this episode, but that's not all we have for Season 1. Remember to use the little eye icon on the top right of the video to vote for your favorite commander, not only in this video, but also in the four seasonal videos, so we know which commanders you want to see come back in kind of the Season 1 favorites match. That video will be airing a little after Season 2 starts, but be sure to vote on those so we know which ones you want to see again, and vote on this one in case we decide to do maybe a Season 1 through 4 favorites and take the winners of everything and kind of put them against each other. So let us know which commanders you would like to see in the future. That is all we have for this video though. We all here at Casually Competitive hope you enjoyed this video and hope you enjoyed Season 1. We have a lot of cool things planned for Season 2 and for the future, so stay tuned. That all being said, my name is Joseph, this is Casually Competitive MTG, and we will see you next time.